One definition of bondage is a state of being bound, usually by compulsion. If I told you that maybe nine out of ten of us who are watching this video are in bondage to today's topic, you might think that sounds a little extreme. Maybe I have you confused with someone who's suffered terrible abuse, addiction, some kind of lifelong dysfunction. No, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me, and I'm not talking about being bound by compulsion to something like coffee or exercise. I'm talking about being bound by compulsion to what other people think. Look at your life. How much of what you do is based on the fear that people will misjudge you? For me, it seems to be just woven into the thread of my life. You know, I'm going to Chick-fil-A for a play date, for instance, and of all things, I'm concerned about my hair. So I spend too long getting ready, and then we're a few minutes behind leaving our house, so I speed so that the new friend I'm meeting won't think I'm a terrible person for being late. Then when we get there, my baby makes a huge mess with the food he's eating, and it's not even funny, y'all, because there are some very just put-together girls around whose kids probably have never, not once in their lives, rubbed ketchup in their hair. Um, then, you know, mid-meal, my friend reach reaches over with this alcohol wipe and wipes my baby's hands off, you know, just mentioning there's a terrible virus going around. And I start wondering, you know, does she think we're unsanitary people and I just always don't wash my kids' hands off when they finish playing in the play area? I think I've got to have them over and make sure they know that we are clean and our house is too. Well, maybe not right now, but when they come over, it will be perfect, and she will know that I always wipe my kids' hands off every time they get out of the Chick-fil-A play area. Then my kids need a nap. Long before my friend's sweet, little, calm, quiet children are ready to leave Chick-fil-A. So my toddler has a meltdown, and we have to leave right away. Do these people think I can't control my kids? I might think, you know, on the way out the door as I, you know, nearly let the door slam on my toddler who's whining um, because I threw this napkin at the trash can inside and, um, you know, it just fell in the floor. And now everyone thinks I litter. Just perfect, right? Does that scenario look like any part of your life? just obsessing or even maybe just pondering what do people think of me we don't want them to misjudge our words our actions or motives we have these overwhelming needs to be liked to make our families proud to be stylish to have enough nice stuff let me explain the passage of scripture from which we derive the title of today's message the approval of man in John 12, we read about many people believing in Jesus but not confessing their faith because they were afraid the Pharisees would no longer allow them to enter the synagogue. John 12 verse 43 says this, For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. The Bible scholar Matthew Henry wrote in his commentary about this passage that these people believed on Jesus, were convinced that he was sent of God, and received his doctrine as divine, but they had not courage to own their faith in him. These people pursued the praise of men more than the praise of God, and this is idolatry. Here are three points for today about this idolatry, the approval of man. The first point for today is trying to win the approval of man will take your focus off of God. Several situations in this re week's reading from Acts highlight the approval mm -hmm. of man issue. Acts 14, 1-2 says this, 
In Iconium they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Here's how a need for approval of other people can be revealed in our lives. The Lord is working in your life. Then, someone is negative toward you, or maybe you just know them so well that you perceive they have some negativity toward you. And at this point, you have two choices for your next step. You can stop what you're doing, take your eyes off of Jesus, and turn your focus onto changing their minds. When we take our eyes off Jesus and attempt to address that negativity or change someone's mind, it's kind of like a little child walking along a path. If he stops focusing on that sidewalk, pretty soon he is just turned the wrong way, roaming around, maybe, in the street. How many times have you been distracted from the work God was doing in your life when someone criticized you and you focused on that criticism and pretty soon were way off your path having to start Mm -hmm. over? In contrast, another option for you would be to continue to grow, be bold, and rely on the Lord to do signs and wonders in your life the same way that Paul and Barnabas did in Acts 14. Here's what they did. In Acts 14, verse 3, it says, Therefore, They spent a long time there, speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of His grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. This alternative sounds much, much better. We fix our eyes and our focus on Jesus, refuse to let the criticism or negativity distract us, and let Jesus do miracles that will defend His name and ours. Remember, our enemy, Satan, wants to wreck, absolutely destroy the Lord's work in your life. And as it says in John 10, 10, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. If you surrender to the desire to please people more than God, the devil has succeeded. 1 Peter 5, 8-9 warns us against this, saying, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. In our case, friends, most of us don't suffer anywhere close to what our brothers and sisters around the world suffer for claiming to believe in Jesus, so we can take comfort in that. Our second point for today is, if you have the approval of man, it will not last. When you have the fickle approval of man, you must not relish it. In Acts 14, beginning in verse 11, we see the crowds of people celebrating Paul and Barnabas and calling them gods. When Paul and Barnabas heard what the people were doing, they snapped into action, explaining that they were just men and attempting to steer that crowd's focus to the one true God. Remember the story of King Herod from Acts chapter 12? Herod did the exact opposite when he was addressing the people and they began to chant that he was a god. Immediately, he was struck by an angel of the Lord with worms that ate him alive. A few moments ago, I called the approval of man fickle. In Paul and Barnabas' case, the crowd wanted to worship them in verse 18, and by verse 19, they stoned Paul. In Herod's case, the people were calling him a god because they knew he was angry with them and did not want him to stop providing food for their country. In other words, they were just calling him a god so that they could manipulate him. If you try to make others accept you by what you say or do or wear or buy or live in or drive, 
as soon as you win that acceptance, it may just slip from your hands. The giving of and refusing of acceptance is manipulation. And wouldn't you prefer to strive to honor God than to give the enemy a foothold in your life by allowing others to have such control? Our third point for today is the bottom line is do what is right, not what will look good to others. You girls who are watching this video undoubtedly represent hundreds of different scenarios in which the approval of man issues can exist. No matter what the situation is, the solution is exactly the same. Seek the Lord and do what he shows you. But I want to highlight the two main areas we can be sinning in this ma matter to help you think about the areas in your life that you may not be victorious yet. A, the first one, is what other people think of us. Turn to Joshua 2. It says in verses 11 through 13, The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshipping the gods of the people around them, and they angered the Lord. They abandoned the Lord to serve Baal and the images of Ashtoreth. The Lord had brought the Israelites into the promised land and had done great works for them. Then the generation after those who had seen all of God's works did not follow the Lord, but instead practiced the false religions of their neighbors. My Bible had a great note on these verses. Here's what it says. Many things can tempt us to abandon what we know is right. The desire to be accepted by our neighbors can lead us into behavior that is unacceptable to God. Don't be pressured into disobedience. My question for you is this. Are you worshiping the gods of your disbelieving neighbors, friends, family members, co-workers, even popular culture? Think about the people closest to you who do not serve the Lord, or at least do not have a strong, life-changing personal relationship with Him. What do they value? What do they worship? What is most important to these people? Whether it's money, or power, or popularity, selfish desires, fun, wine, shopping, their children, or something else, those are idols. I want you to think about your responsibility as a witness to these dear people. John 3.16 says, God sent his son to earth because he loved the world. God wants us to reach that world. How? 1 John 2.6 says, The one who says he abides in God ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. If you never draw any lines, never refuse to look and act and talk just like those people, they will never know you have something, someone, they don't have. I'm all about you walking in the freedom that Christ gives you, and I never want us to be legalistic, but we have to draw some lines. No, I will not go to that place with you. No, I will not enable you to sin by acting like I am comfortable with it. No, you may not tell me that gossip. No, I will not go to that movie with you. No, my kids can't sign up for one more thing because everyone is doing it. I love you, but that is a line I will not cross. We have to say these things and do these things sometimes. So if we're bent out of shape about what the non-believers around us think, we should be much more free with believers, right? Unfortunately, it's just not true for most of us. Maybe the pendulum swings the other way. We just may tr tend to try to appear more godly or more committed than we actually are. Or perhaps we just try to go with the flow, not getting too radical or too lukewarm. Maybe our attitudes are just don't do anything unusual in the name of Jesus that people might not be comfortable with. Here is a word for you. If God has never asked you to do something most people you know would consider weird, you're not listening, friend. The second area we can be sinning 
in the approval of man is in what we think of others. When you are so in bondage to what other people think, you take their standards and hold them up for other people to meet or, in lots of cases, fail to meet. Once I was in the optometrist's office just waiting for my appointment and there was a mom there. She looked about 9 or 10 or 12 months pregnant and she had two preschool aged um, children with her and all three of them just plopped down in the floor and spread out their homeschool stuff and got to work. I was watching them and I wondered how many people in the room were looking at this sweet mama in her giant t-shirt with her kids just chattering away and judged her for not looking more put together or for letting her kids be kids or just for having the gall to homeschool of all places at the optometrist's office. Um, you know, when I was thinking about her, I thought she is probably due with that next sweet baby tomorrow and um, can't fit in any of her maternity clothes anymore. Some of us know what that's like. Or maybe today is the worst day ever because her kid stabbed himself in the eye on accident and she and all her family had to dash out the door to come get him patched up. I watched her some more and saw how she talked with her kids and was so patient. She had some really creative ideas, I could tell, with um, teaching her little kids and getting them motivated to learn. And I just want uh, us to think about her when we think about this topic of the approval of man. Let's refuse to hold up unrealistic, ridiculous, and stuffy standards for everyone else to meet. How many times do we hold these standards up like the Pharisees were always doing? We expect people to be and do all these things that we ourselves know we can't fulfill. Matthew 6, 24 says, You cannot serve two masters. You will hate one and love the other or vice versa. That's true for us today. We cannot pursue the calling of God on our lives and yet at the same time still stay devoted to maintaining other people's favorable opinions of us or meeting and critiquing others on the normal standards that society has established. What other people think is not an accurate gauge of God's opinion. Are you in bondage to the opinions of others compelled by an addiction to winning their approval, or at least feeling like you measure up to their standards, I pray that each of us can break free from that today by the power of the Holy Spirit.